Welcome back to the show, everybody. How Sorry, you doing, Hunter? I was watching myself. <laughs> <laughs> got Hunter Price in the house with us. Also got Aaron Daniel of WJOX. Uh, we're you, just did, talking you have about been stuttering ever since you asked me. I was on a question. It's Joe Hagan. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to come over this little podium. I'm going to jump over that this thing. That is harsh words and I'm for come cable you. television, man. How about you bring our guest in? Jerry Springer got huge on cable television. Jerry Springer has And we're about on. to bring it back Spring, for, Spring, for old Jerry. Springer Future mayor of Door over here. Apparently. All right, cool. So we've got somebody on the phone. We've got representation from all over the state. He's not just somebody. Hmm? He's not just somebody. What would you have me say, Hunter? He is the Joe Hunt from Sports Radio 740 in Montgomery. Well, let's go with that one. Call out Joe. How are we doing? Doing good. I'm pretty sure, Hunter, he's going to want to kill you in the next five to ten minutes. <laughs> it's usually how it goes every week. Uh, Seth usually wants to kill me. I usually, well, not usually, always want to kill Richard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Richard's probably going to end up killing both of us. Probably. In an ironic twist. Probably so. Probably so. So this past week, Joe, SEC Media Days, yeah, what, what, what was your takeaways? What did you see? Uh, what did you think? Um, it's kind of, I think it's kind of taken on a, a new identity. I don't think, and I was listening to you guys a little while ago talk about it. I think we get SEC media days, like, wrong. I think everybody is wanting way too much from SEC media days. And that's just not what, what its intended purpose should be. I mean, you know, to me, I'm looking at, the way that they've kind of hinted at moving this thing around. And I'm starting to think that that part of moving this, this event around to whether it would be Atlanta, Nashville, Dallas, where, wherever it may be, would all be in also reinventing what SEC Media Days is. And I think that, again, you know, you guys are talking about, you know, people are scared to ask coaches questions. People are, are scared to do this. We don't really get anything from it. I expected more from Hugh Freeze. You, that's not the purpose of SEC Media Days. Like, this is just, what I like to call it, it's a chips and salsa. Like, it's the appetizer <laughs> of the college football season. Well, like, I mean, what, what is for, for the football season. What, well, I mean, then, what is the point of us even getting together for just some chips and salsa? Like, I don't, I don't come over and have a party just to eat chips and salsa. Perhaps, you know, want, perhaps guys I, like I Les a, Miles. I want a burger and a hot dog Maybe we're well. spoiled on great Soundbite guys like Spurrier and, and uh, Bielema and, and Les Miles, we're, maybe we're spoiled. You know, back in the day, it probably wasn't this media circus well, that it is I'm now. What I'm just getting at is, what's the point in even getting together to sit around and talk about what we already know? I mean, it's, it's a, it seems to me like a whole bunch of waste of money if we're just not going to really push the coaches and put them on their hot seat and, and really find out the questions we want to know. Because... Sir. Joe. Sure. Okay. <laughs> you are getting it wrong. Okay. You just said it a few minutes ago. The per you don't go to somebody's house for chips and salsa. No. You do come for the meal. But the meal is the season. When you get to the house, what do you do? You walk in, you kind of look at the plate a little bit, you kind of assess everything, and then you get ready for, for the thing. Maybe the food's still cooking outside. That's the purpose of SEC Media Day is not for us to get here and to find out who all starting quarterbacks is going to be and who all this is going to be. Like, we look at this wrong because we always expect Philip Fulmer to get a subpoena every single year. <laughs> well, no, well, I mean, no, like, don't get me wrong. I'm not, expe I'm not expecting any SEC coaches, I mean, any quarterbacks to be named or anything like that. I'm just – when it comes to Hugh Freeze, I just feel like he should have – been pushed more on this issue and and, and and part of that is because I mean he came in saying like well you know I can't comment on it like coaches love to do that right I mean who doesn't love to do that when they're being pressed legally like I just I'm sorry I just can't comment my lawyers are telling me not to comment I mean at the end of the day we all got hyped up yes but we should have already known like he wasn't going to give us jack squat because he already knows he's five feet deep looking at six. Well, apparently I just look at this all wrong. But. <laughs> you do. You do. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, appreci I appreciate that. <laughs> you know, well, I mean, I, honest with you, I mean, it's, the, the way that this should be is, is this thing has to evolve, okay? And, and what this thing needs to evolve to, because all of you guys have been to 
an SEC championship. All of you guys have, have been to these, these big games. You have a fan fest, you have events, you have merchandise being sold. Like, that is the next step in the evolution of a media day. Like, because this can't happen with the ACC kickoff. Like, that thing was, was two days long, and people even forgot that it was going on. But if you were to move this say, to the World Congress Center right across from Mercedes-Benz Stadium, you put it inside of the, the gigantic room that SEC Fan Fest is in, think about all the Alabama fans that were in that little pit, and think about if you gave them merchandise to buy, if you gave Georgia fans merchandise to buy, if you brought your team's new polos, if you brought your new, like Auburn just a little while ago shot out an email about their new dry fit they have for this football season because they redesign them every single year. And I looked at it and went, all right, that one's legit. I want to get that one. If you bring all of that stuff, you can make a fortune from turning this into more of like a festival than us worrying about what Hugh Freeze is going to say when we know he can't comment about a lawsuit. Not because he's trying to be a DB, but because legally he cannot say anything because it can be held against him if this thing does go to court. No, you know, I, I haven't looked at it like that from, you know, taking it to court and not being allowed to say things. And when you put it toward, when you put it like the way you're putting it to where you're bringing in apparel and you're making this about the fans, I haven't looked at SEC Media Days in that way. And when yeah. you look at it, and when you do it in that way, I totally get what you're saying 100%. Yeah, but because, I mean, it's look, not like in the that Pac way, though. Pac-12 wouldn't be able to do it this way. The, the Big 12 might because they kind of have the following because it's in Dallas and majority of these teams are in Texas anyway with Big 12. The ACC kickoff is like at a golf course, I'm pretty sure is what it is. Big 10 Media Days is, is in downtown Chicago, so it doesn't have the facilities to be able to do this. But if you're going to be the biggest and you're going to be the first, and we all know that SEC Media Days has outgrown Birmingham. I mean, we have tables shoulder to shoulder. There's People that, that are trying to figure out if it's worth their investment as far as radio stations to pay the money to go to it. And, and for, for us, if you turn it into more of a kickoff, like the ACC names it as an ACC kickoff, but you turn this into more of a fan fest and festival and celebrating the teams, then this has more of a purpose than us coming in and wanting to hear Dan Mullen talk about what shoes he's wearing this year. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah. I, I, like, I like making it more about the fans. Just just. Forget everything else and just make it about the fans but, and commercialize the heck out of but it. But to be fair, Joe Aaron Daniel here, and I gotta say, yeah. you talk about not you know you talk about the you know not liking how we're trying to get the gotcha stuff. But I know you enjoyed one particular question that was asked in the radio and internet room uh, by a young man named Jeremy yeah. Law, and I think we have the audio for that uh, for that little for that question that was asked to Auburn head coach uh, Gus Malzahn. Richard, yeah. do you have that audio? That was good. He's got it. All right. So, yeah, y'all uh, y'all enjoy this because this is actually a really good question. And, and I mean, it, it provokes some thought from me. It's a good point. Good. Go ahead and hit him with that, Richard. It'll be media after coach, a your record after four <laughs> years is almost identical to your predecessor. Why were you given a so, fifth Sorry, what did you have for lunch today? <laughs> Say that again. Actually, I went to beat up, man. We your had, record uh, is almost uh, identical to Gene Chilic, your Wildlife, predecessor. Why were you given uh, a fifth season in Auburn? I mean, we were the number two team in the SEC last year. Hey, run, and, uh, run that back, know, Richard. We were on a real good run. And yeah, run that back. Run the back. All right, here we go. Jeremy Law, Marble City Media Coach, your record after four years is almost identical to your predecessor. Why were you given a fifth season? Say that again. <laughs> your record is almost identical to Gene Chizik, your predecessor. Why were you given a fifth season at Auburn? I mean, we were the number two team in the SEC last year, and uh, you know we went on a real good run. And it was pretty unfortunate we had a you know a couple key injuries late. Uh, but you know this year I'm really looking forward to the year, and I think we got to compete, a chance to compete for a championship. That's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you do think it's an interesting question, See, Gus. Now that, that that is interesting. Do we need more uh, of that, that though at SEC media yes. days? We need more guys asking. Like, just be blunt. And ask you. Know, that's hey. all. That's all I'm asking. That's all I'm getting at is let's ask. Let's you know, ask an educated question like you got a college degree, Dad <laughs> I mean that, that's a great question. Now I will say this, and it was brought up uh, on TV a couple of weeks ago, and I thought it was interesting. I think people value uh, access in journalism more than actual good questions and good research. Mm. And by that I mean, when you ask a tough question 
for the, you know, for the, for the head honchos, the powers oh. that be, when you ask Saban a stupid question or something like that, your access is cut off. Really like, people ain't going to talk to you. Your sources are not going to talk you to you. I think seen, you were scared of that. Well, you should have seen the Auburn people in the room bug-eyed around the, around right? standing around the wall. I, am, I imagine Mr. Law's name has been put down on a, on a, on a log right? somewhere. Right, like, you ain't going to get not to ask any more questions question ever again. But, but, <laughs> but, Joe, should we be seeing more of that at media days? Well, no, because the people that had the bug eyes that you were just talking about, they already knew the answer. They, they didn't need the answer. That's, again, because their sources have given them the answers. See, and, and, you know, it goes back to the Hugh Freeze thing. I mean, you know, if, if you are somebody that is inside the program the way that a lot of these, these beat writers are, you know, I mean, using Auburn for an instance, you're, you're Brandon Marcello, these guys that – could probably honestly text Malzahn whenever he wanted to and ask him a question to get something that he could possibly use as a quote-unquote source. They don't have to ask that question because they know that Jay Jacobs has probably told them something. Heck, I know what people have told me, and I know the reason why he still has the job. So there's no reason to ask that question because it's not for the fans to know the answer to it. It's for the team and the coaches and the beat writers who already know the answer. Now, what one of you just said about his access getting cut off, yeah, I wouldn't doubt that. I, I seriously, seriously would not doubt that one bit. And that's the problem. Because a lot of these beat writers want to get in to cover the program, especially like with Alabama. Think about, it. Think about Aaron Suttles, for instance. Aaron Suttles is not going to go in and ask that question because his job is too valuable to him. But he and because he knows that he has the number of sources that if he ever wanted to ask that question, I'm sure there's either a coach that would talk to him anonymously, there's some member of the Red Elephant Club that would talk to him anonymously. Well, we like that is that's the way that it's done now. It's not done the same way that he did it back in nineteen seventy five and nineteen eighty six. This has all changed. And so this is the reason why when Cecil hints at something or Aaron Suttles hints at something, you pay attention to it because they know information. They're not just pulling a dart at the wall. And, again, I, I, again, I, told, the kid, I told him right afterwards because he was a table down for us. Look, I, I applaud you having the guts to ask the question, and that's, that's all you really need is that you have the guts to ask that question. You've already been embarrassed uh, across the nation. All right, you're good for the rest of your career. Nothing can scare you anymore. Yeah, and – I, I get, I get, and I understand it from what you're saying. It, and I, I totally get it. And like Aaron Suttles, someone that's associated with like Alabama and is a beat writer, you can't ask those questions. But at the same time, Clay Travis wouldn't be where Clay Travis is now. Feinbaum would not be where Feinbaum is now if they did not ask those questions. Do, do you know? Think about it right now, because because Feinbaum is is, is also uh, is obviously a great example. Do you believe that if somebody today was starting the type of show that Feinbaum has created, do you think it would be successful? It, it depends if it's uh, done on the Alabama Cable Network on Channel Charter. <laughs> no, I mean, I, no the, the answer would be no. But no, yeah. Well, the, no. the problem is there's, there's written journalism has lost a lot of its credibility. It's not exactly. the same as it was when Feinbaum no, was doing it. Journalism. in the 1980s and 90s when Feinbaum was coming up. The reason why he is where he is now is because of the credibility. Now, and, and Feinbaum has this ability to poke fun at every single person. It doesn't matter if you're a Mississippi State fan or an Ole Miss fan. And, so, and, and if an Ole Miss fan is on the phone and they're wanting to make fun of something Mississippi State has done, all Feinbaum's got to do is, well, you know, you guys talk to me when you guys can actually win an egg bowl again, and then 14 Ole Miss callers call in, and he's good <laughs> for the rest of his show. Like, that's what, that's what his show is. He has the connections, and it goes back to what we're talking about, your Cecil Hurts, your Aaron Suttles, your Brandon Marcellos. They all have the sources and the connections inside the university that they don't have to go out and be this extreme, you know, Howard Stern-type person anymore because now they have the credibility that they don't have to do that. If, if a brand-new coach gets hired inside the SEC, what show do they go to? They go to Feinbaum. If a, if a player is about to get drafted, whether it's basketball, baseball, or football, where do they go? They go to Feinbaum's show. He doesn't have to do all that anymore. And even Feinbaum doesn't do that stuff anymore. Feinbaum only speaks when Feinbaum has information. From any one of his sources. It's true. I mean, uh, I mean he, it, he, comes from a, he comes from an era where, I mean, you, just, you had to have 
all these sources to run all your columns and even when he was getting big with the radio show, I mean, he was still kind of oh, stockpiling. I was listening to Fine Bomb when it was on AM 960. Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, that's a long, a long time, time ago. And before we, before we jump to baseball, Joe, I do, I'm still upset that what I thought was the most interesting and funniest part of SEC Media Days just has not caught on with anyone. And that is Saban. I'm, I'm going to pause you on this because I'm going to say before you say this, if, this, if there was ever – a let's say campaign that a politician was running and hunter was trying to campaign for something this would be his what his campaign would be all about go ahead oh 100 percent. it's, it's saving mom gate you know saving it, mom <laughs> yeah <laughs> saving mom gate <laughs> for a second straight year for a second straight year two years in a row now yeah. his mother has sat outside in the back seat of the car staring straight ahead Waiting for Saban to come out, and it is the I'm funniest thing ever. Not that it's not even plus. Like I don't. I, why would your mother even come to SEC Media Days? It, why does she come to? I, it's, it blows my mind. Why does she come? No one ever sees her walk in the door. No one ever sees her <laughs> around. Saban's not hanging out. Maybe it's like he's always on the move. Maybe that 45 minutes from Tuscaloosa to Birmingham is all they get. Maybe. But it, it blows my mind, and it's so funny. Every year she sits in the back seat of the car for over an hour and a half. They're like, okay, Mrs. Saban, it's time to go. Let's pull the car around. All righty, let's get in the back seat. And then she sits there for an hour and a half outside the door. And it's- Look, I'll tell you right now, if my child was making Nick Saban's money, I would just kick back and throw a movie in and not care. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, it, it does improve your, it does improve, uh, you know, a lot when you're, when you are sitting in the back of a six figure bins. Well, yeah, but I mean, it was just funny because all it's got, we were- Climate controlled. No, we were working some really cool we were working with in there. we were working with ESPN and, uh, behind the scenes and all us guys on the utility and camera guys we all had little bets going on how long she would be <laughs> yeah. in the back seat of the car i mean there was like 20 guys that had placed an over under on 45 I sub- minutes i severely <laughs> underestimated it by the way i just feel like if this is something that that joe hunt and aaron daniels could get behind next year <laughs> we could we could see betty nods in vegas for it coming into SEC media days <laughs> I'll, AD, I'll hand this one to you, bud. You, you can have it. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, I, I don't know who Aaron Daniels is. You're up there in the radio room. Aaron Daniel, Aaron Daniels, give me a break. I, I will voluntarily, I will voluntarily give this to you, AD. It's, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna. Am I'm gonna, I just I'm the only wash, one that just wash thinks? My hands. Am I, I? I have, I have told Hunter if we get to next year, I might, uh, I might pull a Jeremy Law and ask a, a, a stupid question in media days and ask Saban how his mother's doing in the back of the car right now. You should like that would. I don't be, know. <laughs> That would. How long do you plan on your mother Ooh, waiting for you? To, I don't know. Like it is just so. Like she's that's fine. A, that's a risky one. But it's just. It's that's just a risky so one because he'd be like, "What did you say?" Yeah. That's exactly <laughs> what Malzahn said. So yeah. But all right. So now let's just forget that conversation ever just happened. I guess. Sure. Uh, let's move on to baseball. All right. Joe, the Braves seem like they're finally getting it together. What can you tell us? Well, here's the here's the philosophy of the Atlanta Braves. And, and it's one that's it's kind of deep, and it's also kind of a, a, a mind bender, and you just got to think about it for a second. Because even I tried to pitch this to my wife, and I think I got the look of what on earth are you talking about today. The, the, what the Braves are now trying to do is they're not trying to find a pitcher on the trade market that can win them games. What they're trying to do now, since they're in a position that they are, they're going to have to try to now find a pitcher that won't lose them games. Because the way that this pitching staff has worked, if you take over old fat boy out of this, and, and God be with every single Minnesota Twins fan right now, if you take him out of this, and you take Julio Teron and what he has done at SunTrust out of this, the Braves are in first place right now. I mean, that's... that's that's the whole, that's the truth. That's, the, that's not even counting Jim Johnson's horrific way that he closed the baseball game. So the problem is, I don't know who the Braves are going to go get because the main name that they're looking for is on a team right now that is in the AR, AR wall card race, and the Rays are not trading Chris Archer. It's, I heard uh, Ozzy Albez, uh, Albi, Ozzy Albi? Ozzy Albi? Yeah. Albi? Ozzy Albee, I like that name, Ozzy Albee. Is he someone the Braves really are willing to trade, or is that just a name they're throwing out there? To- well, see, the, the problem is, is his connection is going to be to Brandon Phillips. 
And with, with the way Phil's contract is working, it's a very, very easy contract. It would be like you paying your, your camera guy $5 to do the show. It's like, okay, I can pay you 5 bucks. It's no problem whatsoever. He's only, Blazer only having to pay him a million dollars. And the thing is, is he's actually playing very well. Most, most of Blazer executives probably thought that, all right, he's going to be here for a little while. You're going to be able to train him. We're going to be out of the race. Ozzy Albies is going to come up and start playing second base the way that we thought he was going to. And we can trade Brandon Phillips for somebody else that's in need. The only problem is that now the Braves are kind of in that weird situation because the, the, Rockies, the Rockies won today, but obviously the Diamondbacks lost. But the Braves are, I'm not sure if it's five or six games now, out of the wild card position. So I look at this and think to myself, the Braves are going to have to be buyers. The one person I think that could get traded is Nick Markakis. I think that he could potentially be somebody that gets traded only because I really believe that possibly Ronald Acuna is going to be up with this team before the end of August. He's that good of an outfielder, and he is raking in Gwinnett. And if you can trade Markakis, who's in a hitting slope right now, get something for him, have Acuna come up, because again, you're not trying to win games. You're trying not to lose games. And when Amar Kankis is not hitting, and you've got Matt Adams doing what he's doing, Freddie Freeman is starting to rake again, and you have this lineup, you just need somebody that can get on base. And if Amar Kankis can't do this, but you could package him with Julio Teron, get you a solid starter, and potentially some sort of, we'll say, pitcher that's going to be, not really a pitcher, they don't need a pitcher, but they need a more outfield then you could possibly be training Nick Markakis and Julio Tehran the next couple of weeks. I, I, I actually would be okay with Julio Tehran. I've, I've never understood the hype about him. I, I get he's a great pitcher, but he's always seemed inconsistent to me. Well, he, he, uh, got, he got rushed into everything. And, and the same thing happened with Brandon Beachy. The same thing happened with, with Chris Medlin, who I also think is going to get brought up in the next couple of weeks as well, possibly to be a long, uh, long bullpen arm if they ever need it. Hmm. I think that, that those guys – that happened to him. You can look at Jair Jurgen. That's another name of a brace pitchers that came up and just floundered. I mean, heck, Jair Jurgen did better in the WBC this year than what he ever did for the Atlanta Braves. I mean, it's, it's that type of that type of pitcher and the mentality that the Braves had. The thing about the Braves is they almost have an entire pitching staff ready down in Mississippi. I mean, it's it's almost they they've got three more pitchers down in Mississippi that could be in the rotation next year. That's how deep this team is. The only problem is, is you're not going to have Fulton Evich, R.A. Dickey, along with Sean Newcomb and three other, two or three other rookie pitchers. Somebody's getting traded from that group. Somebody's going to go somewhere. Some there's a lot of guys going to have to get traded because I mean I'm looking at you're talking about Jose Albi, Albi, Albi and how, what he's doing. What about Johan Carmargo? Is that did I pronounce that right? Well, yeah, Johan Camargo, well, see, the way that, that Camargo has been playing is he's a utility guy. If, if Dansby Swanson isn't producing, they can put him at shortstop. If Freddie Freeman goes over to first base because the Braves are facing a lefty now, then Camargo can go to third base and Matt Adam gets the time off. Okay. Lane Adams is a great option from the, from the bench. You saw that last night with that big hit that he had right down the left field line. Like, they have guys that they can build a solid bench on, but at the same time, those guys are all young. Acuna, Dansby Swanson, uh, Ozzy Albee, those guys are all young. Personally, for me, I still want a solid catching option. Tyler Flowers I don't believe in as far as more than one season. I don't believe in Kurt Suzuki for more than one season. I think both of these guys are performing well now. But remember, there was also supposed to have Betancourt as going to be their next catching option. They also were supposed to have Salto Lamaki as another catching option, and neither one of those actually panned out for the Braves, mainly because the Braves traded Salto Lamaki to the Rangers. But as uh, for, I believe it was Mark Teixeira. But at the same time, I still want to see a young catching prospect come up for the Braves. That's what their biggest need is going towards the future. All right, real quick, I need the yes or no answer. We got to cut the break. The Braves are six and a half games back in the wild card right now, I believe. Can they win a wild card spot this year? I believe they can. Now, I don't think that they can, they're going to be able to go far. Um, I, I don't even know if they'll be able to actually win the wild card game to get into the NLDS. They can get into the wild card. And I'll tell you, the one pitcher the Braves have on their staff, actually there's two, 
the two pitchers that the Braves have on their staff that could be very dangerous in the playoffs is Fulton Evich and is Sean Newcomb. Those are their two most dangerous pitchers that could evolve in the playoffs if the Braves were to get into an NLDS. And it always helps that they just swept the current leader of the NL wild card race. Yeah, it, uh, it most certainly does one again today. Uh, Go ahead, Jay. Cubs, they get the Cubs coming up this week. They also then travel out. They have to play the Diamondbacks again, and they have to play the Dodgers. They also get the Rockies at the end of, of August. There, there's a lot of opportunities for this team to move up in this month. But, again, these next two series are showing that the Braves are going to be buyers or sellers. With the way this team is playing, they will be buyers at the deadline. They, got, they have to be. It's, it's about time the Braves are buyers. Joe Honk, sure. thank you for joining us. Everybody can check. Catch, yeah, you can catch Joe Honk every, what is it, 2 o'clock, Sports Radio 740. Every, every Monday, yeah, every Monday through Friday. Sports Radio 740, you can download the app in your app store as well as catch us online at sportsradio740.com. Hey, had a blast hanging out with you this weekend, Joe. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Uh, On tap. On tap. Yeah, certainly. Great talking to you. We'll see you again later. Hi, man. Bye. All right, everybody. Like you said, we got to take a little break, but we'll be right back. We're going to talk through a few more of the media's predictions for the SEC football season coming up in 2017. You won't want to miss this. Stick Actually, around. we're not coming back. We lied. Head to Carl Cannon. <laughs>